I'm sitting here with Rod Stryker, founder of Para Yoga and author of The Four Desires. And I'm very, very excited to be here with Rod. Thank you for coming. Of course, man. I'm glad I can hear it. Yeah, I, I've been trying to set up this interview for quite some time, but then you went off to India. What do you do when you go to India? I have this, uh, this privilege to actually go and practice in this very unique setting that's supercharged. First of all, it's very aesthetically quiet and calm. It's very atypical to India. India is noisy and polluted and difficult to get settled in anything. It's anything but peaceful. But this particular area, um, my teacher actually built, my mentor, and uh, I go and I practice and meditate and keep life very simple and maybe journal and write and it's time for it's a time for reflection take time out so i took rod striker's enlightened life class with the aspen yoga society yeah they put together they gave me the opportunity to teach at the aspen chapel and and that's where we met and so that's where i met rod and um and i have to tell you that was a year ago or a little over a year ago and um i'm not going to use the cliche that it changed my life but what it did was meeting with you once a month kept me uh, first of all had me really figure out what my purpose was but really kept me on track and got me really in tune with the meditation practice and and um, staying true to myself mm -hmm. and so I have so many questions to you about that okay so I started meditating more religiously and um, and all these serendipitous things started happening. Mm -hmm. the, the magic started happening. What do you, what do you think about that magic part of it all? Well, it's a, it's you know, it's it's hard to uh, capsulize. But what I would say is inherently, what meditation does, first of all, is it helps. The aim of meditation is one to quiet our mind down. But then the question is, well, when the mind's quiet, what's left? And that's really what is at the crux of your question, because what's left. Is our mind get quiet? You know, when your mind is, our mind is really has a very important role to play in life, which is that it's supposed to keep us um, inquiring into: Are we doing things right? Is, are things safe? What's next? How am I going? Oh, I've got to measure my past against the present moment, and so it's very analytical. The mind, even if we don't consider ourselves brilliant, the mind is analytical. That's what it does. You make your mind more quiet, and what begins to happen is that there's really intelligence behind the mind. Different traditions call it, you know, it could be awareness, it could be the seer, or it could be the soul. Depends on, you know, what your orientation is, you'll call it different things. And the soul really has, it's inherently tied into the cohesiveness of life, whereas our mind separates us from everything else, so it keeps us safe, makes all those good judgments, but the soul is actually, has, and is part of this vast interconnected web of pure intelligence. And from there, as we begin to get more connected to it, it sounds like that's what was happening for you. You now spontaneously begin to have a different, um, in essence, you find yourself in a different place in the world and in your life because you're being led by a deeper field of intelligence than just the doubting mind. And now, if you have a, an intention, uh, a, an interest to grow, which is, by the way, inherently part of the characteristics of the soul, and for instance, we see that when someone's very young, a baby, they want to lift their head, they want to roll over, they want to crawl, they want to stand, they want to walk, they want to run. That interest to grow is not learned. It's inherent. It's part of the soul. So now you start, we start quieting our mind down, we reinforce that for you in this course, and then, then we're starting to find that part of us that inherently does expand, inherently is curious and is inspired and is motivated and can step outside of the heartache and the confusion that we've had in our past and now spontaneously we start coming alive and you you know the way you described it the magic that's what we see in two and three and four and five year olds we see magic you know so that's what was going on so we we i really wanted to move to aspen so that our middle son could join our older son at the Aspen High School. And I said the perfect scenario would be if my husband who's a builder has a client that has like a tear down and then we and that happened. And then when it happened, I was like, but I love this saw. I don't want to leave. And then I thought, you created yeah. this. You need to make it happen. So that was just an example of the things that were happening that um, just I was setting my intention on. And yeah. yeah, well that's one of the signs that you're actually in your soul stuff that you are relating to the soul stuff is that the distance between the 
proposal of the of the desire, you know, when it comes into your mind, and the time it takes to fulfill it, shortens. So it's a good sign. But then you have to commit, right? Yeah. If you wish yeah, it, yeah. you have to you, commit yeah, to it. Courage. <laughs> Courage to change, you know, as we said, right. to step into more of who we are sometimes is, is challenging. When you said, you said in your class, when someone has, is struggling with something, and you say, start meditating, and then, you know, you get feedback, I, oh, I can't, I'm not the one, I can't do that, I'm not the type to meditate. I meditate through my hiking or whatever it is, but I can't sit and meditate. And then six months later, they come back to you and they still have their problems and you ask, have you started meditating? Well, I know of a lot of people like that. And so what what can you tell people to say, if you're so struggling, this is why the meditation will happen. I know we're being repetitive with what you're saying, but I think people really need to hear we how it helps. We don't have to be, and I just want to... The question's a wonderful one, and it's actually an important question, because um, the fact is that change is harder than anything else. I find change to be the biggest challenge for human beings. And, and uh, in essence, what happens is as we start meditating, as we describe, you naturally start, one part of you starts becoming more quiet and less in charge, and another part of this intuitive, holistic, inspired, empowered place becomes more in charge. And yet a lot, and that's unfamiliar to most of us, you know, until we start experiencing that other part of ourselves. We don't really have that experience since we were three and four and five years old. But we start stacking some heartache and some disappointments and some loss, and it starts covering that innocent, vibrant curiosity and, and, um, and holism and health and curiosity. So the truth is that when we start stepping to a better part of ourselves, very often there's a soft recoil we almost would prefer, and this is human nature, we would prefer the comfort of the known. Even if it's not helpful, even if it's somewhat painful, than the discomfort of the unknown. Even if the unknown is inspired and unique and totally like breaking out of your shell or breaking out of your, your, your old state. And this happens a lot. You know, and most of us, as we start feeling this new part of us coming forward, there'll actually be a recoil. We'll actually then, we actually stand at kind of a precipice, a choice point in a way. Am I going to continue to meditate and continue to inspire the positive changes, or am I going to step back into what is familiar? And in a way you have to, I think just hearing that, wait a minute, you know, growth actually has discomfort to it. I told, I was teaching yesterday and I told a group, you know, the deeper you go, the more uncomfortable it gets in one, some ways, and yet the more fulfilling it gets. And um, again, using this metaphor of children, um, you know, children take risks when we're really young and we take risks and we don't judge ourselves and we don't look, is anyone watching? And children, before they learn to walk, have failed hundreds and hundreds of times. And then before they can go to the next step, they fail. And as human beings, as, as we get to be, you know, into adulthood, we start to lose the willingness to fail because of all the self-judgment we have. So I just offer people first, just know that as you get deeper and as you become, step more into the fullness of who you are, it may be unfamiliar. You may want to actually, you may feel some resistance. You may then even stop doing the things that would help you. And as long as we know that's part of the game, then you go, well, I'm just going to carry on the discomfort, uh, through the discomfort. Last thing on that is the yoga tradition, from which you know a lot of my knowledge and inspiration comes from, literally tells us just keep doing it and don't worry about the results. Just keep doing it. And that, that's, a, that's a key piece of my Well, and also for me, either, if you think of everything as a test, that I, you know, that you're being tested with your strengths and your, you know, then it helps you to get through. You think you see everything as a lesson, and so that probably has a lot to do with being clear, having clarity with what's happening to you in your life. But I wanted to go um, talk to you about how you are steeped in ancient wisdom with your teachings, and and there's a lot of uh, new yogis, or uh, they consider themselves yogis, that are popping up. That I, it's wonderful that they're bringing 
yoga and meditation to the masses, but with you, it's your wisdom. And I, I wanted to talk about that time in LA. You were all sort of, what, in your 20s and you were all practicing together and, and you didn't think that you were doing it for, to be successful. But what was driving you and what was it about your mentors and your teachers that you held on to that kept you going at such a young age? You know, um, three things, when you ask that question, Julian, three things come to mind. Number one, uh, the late 70s, early 80s, the, the idea of being a professional yoga teacher <laughs> just didn't exist. It, you know, there was there was studying and experiencing yoga, but the idea that you could actually make a living was absurd, an absurd idea. So those of us who were actually practicing 1978, 79, 80, 82, 84, 85, late 80s, early, early to mid 80s, mid, mid late 80s is when it started to change a little bit. We were practicing because we, we felt it doing something for us. I actually started teaching in 1980 because not to make a living, but because I knew if I was teaching I would learn more. But the, and, and then the other thing is that fundamentally the reason that a, a lot of yoga teachers stop growing as students is because Americans' expectations of what yoga is is so low. And because our expectations culturally are so low, anyone can be a yoga teacher. If they can say, hey, exhale, bend over, wow, they seem like they're a yoga teacher. They know more than I do. And since I, since I was in this development stage of my yoga studies and yoga teaching in a time where I, I just fell into great fortune where uh, my teacher was a master, he was a master, he had, studied, had done yoga and already taught yoga for almost 50 years. He had studied in India, and studied with some of the luminaries of, of, uh, of the previous century. And so when I looked at this man, there was no way I could learn what I needed to know. There's no way I could even approach his knowledge in a year, let alone a 200 hour teacher training, which can be done in six weeks. It wouldn't take me three years, it wouldn't take me 12 years, I still wouldn't get to that knowledge. So the fact that I had a mentor who had so much knowledge, it began to paint a very different picture for me. And and I was hungry, and because my those experiences with this person who was one, very knowledgeable, the two was this amazing human being. I mean, he, he was successful financially in his career. He was effusive in his love of his grandchildren. He was he loved clothes. He loved life. He loved food. He drank wine once in a while. He he was he was just an object lesson in seeing a person with, with fullness in their life. Plus, he had all this esoteric knowledge. Plus, he could take me into meditation and a depth of which I never dreamed of. So, I felt a kind of. Um, what would be the right word? I felt a kind of obligation to rise at least as best as I could to his level. And you know, I think unfortunately a lot of teachers don't have that opportunity today because yoga is available everywhere, but most of the people distributing it aren't in the same model I was. I was in this model of seeing a figure who studied for 50 years and practiced and embodied it. And so our expectation is if someone has a good body, they move well, they're personable, they sound like they they can move me safely in and out of some poses, then they're my yoga teacher. And um, uh, so in a way, we're all a little bit lesser for it in terms of the yoga that's available. But I, at the same time, I just say, look, I'm just gifted and I was blessed to have it. So do you ever, do you feel a sense of urgency to uh, mentor others so that you can pass down that sage wisdom? Yeah, it's a, if you wanted to kind of single out, or if I have singled out my vision or mission, what is meaningful, meaningful for me and my teaching indeed is to have these you know, richly qualified teachers who can do more than just move people's bodies, that say, you know, that you can really move their mind and touch their soul. And, but the other piece of it is, again, highlighted by examples of my teachers, is that they're really full human beings. They're pragmatic, they live in the world, they're, they're vital, they're kind, they're loving, they're not, they don't renounce life at the same time, they're not so subsumed in the world that they don't have this connection to something deeper. And that is very much the mission that drives me, but it's not just distributing ancient information for the sake of distributing ancient information, it's distributing ancient information as it did for the likes of you, Julian, which is to, 
elevate the quality of your life where you're not only putting stuff out in the world that's better, but having a richer relationship to your family and having a richer relationship to yourself. So it's really not knowledge for the sake of knowledge. I mean, that's an that's, that's a, that's a, um, appropriate mission, but it's really not mine per se. It's really, it's, what is the knowledge that we need in, this, in these times to really to kind of suit and address all the elements of our life? If you want to go deep into yoga, great. If you want to have a more successful career, what do I need to know? Different things. So that's why, for instance, when we did the Enlightened Life, I used very little yoga terminology. Uh, and, and my idea was that anyone's aunt could have done that, who had never done yoga. And really, strategies, as you said, to discover your purpose, be more um, creative, expand your capacities. And that's what that course was all about. Tell us about your, your certification classes that you need. Uh, you know, there's um, so what went into the design of my of teacher training was uh, the fact that teacher training is available a lot of places. Um, it's ubiquitous. Anywhere you go, you can almost find a 200-hour teacher training. The nature of that is the idea of training someone to teach in 200 hours uh, is really, um, I, you know, it's it's quite an idea, really. It's almost impossible to know how to do that. So. Uh, in order to get to what you need to do to teach a class in 200 hours, you teach a lot of little, you teach a lot of things. What I call that is a horizontal model of learning, where it's just a lot of little things, but it's you can only touch on those. So there's instruction in the poses, basic philosophy, something about maybe um, uh, hands-on adjustment, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So ideally, really, people have had that before they've come to me. And then what I do, in because I call them master trainings, I don't even use the word teacher, I say uh, they're par yoga master trainings. And in essence, you've gotten some of the fundamentals, and now what I do is I go in a ver vertical learning model, which is have people go deep into one idea, so deep into the principles of sequencing, like how really you construct a class to have the most beneficial effects specific to what you want. Do you want someone relaxed? Do you want someone inspired? Do you want someone... Um, do you want to work on the internal organs? Do you want to work on the back? So how do we sequence in a way, scientifically, to get the best results? So we go into nine different subjects in five-day training. And uh, that's, that's the curriculum. I've actually just commenced to putting the first four online so that we can people can do them remotely. And I'm really, they just came out June 1st and I'm thrilled with how it's actually moving. So where do they find that? They can find connection to it at paryoga.com, our site. That's paryoga.com. And it's on, I partnered with a company called Yoga Glow, which has, it's the largest, um, I also have classes on Yoga Glow, which is the largest uh, down, uh, yoga class downloadable site in the world. And uh, there's something like, I have 50 or 60 classes there, but four of these trainings are now online. And anyone can embark and jump into it. So, let, so what is para yoga and what is tantric? Tantric or tantric? Ta ta well, tantra would be the right word, but we will say tantric yoga or tantric hatha yoga. Those are long answers. Uh, para yoga is easy. Para yoga is really just the dissemination of uh, yoga for our age, based on the ancient tradition. We had this conversation around what my teachers gave me. Well, they taught me more than just moving my body. They really showed me the uh, the how to attain the goal of really truly affecting the mind, affecting our breath, our energy, our internal body, but then ultimately how do we touch the soul? How do we touch something that no matter what you do in the world, you're never going to feel this. You're never going to have that impact. So it's this broad scope of techniques. The truth is if you came to a par yoga, you've done yoga before and you have a certain expectation what it looks like, for the most part a par yoga class is going to look like 70 or 80 percent of what you do in most yoga classes but there's a more systematic approach and some other elements maybe a little more detail with the breath a little bit more uh, a, some uh, specific methodology about how you relax based on the poses you did then maybe integration with the breath and sitting up and those are the ways that we move deeper so that's really it's par yoga is this kind of it, drawing from the ancient knowledge making it very applicable to the modern age and making sure it's not just one-dimensional yoga. And Tantra is really the found, is the fountain or the reservoir from which Pari Yoga has come. Tantra is a, it's a vast uh, spiritual science or school. It's a, we could call it even a tradition. 
and some of which use yoga postures and some tantric traditions don't use yoga postures. The ones that do look at the body as the fundamental temple or altar of life. And that if you know how to enter and navigate your temple, then you can actually find everything you're looking for within yourself. It doesn't mean that God's not outside of you. It just means that you connect to this grander idea through asana, through your breath, through the postures, through the mind, through intention, and these other ideas. So Tantra has super, super vast. I'm utilizing the portion of it that focuses on yoga science to make people's lives really you know, soar and become more magical. It sounds like you really intellectualize your practice and, and, um, and what, what I was learning from you. You speak in a language that I can understand and then implement it in my life, but you intellectualize it and that's what I was needing because I was meditating before I went to your class, but I wanted to know on a deeper, more intellectual level and I started to read everything and what, what it means. So let's talk about what are the four desires? Four desires, subject of my book, and what the, this ancient teaching suggests us it, to us, and it makes a lot of sense. As you said, you know, sometimes it's easy to get lost the fact that it's really old, and you go, okay, it's tradition for tradition's sake. But what does it mean to me today? So, in essence, what it says is that our we have a we have a soul. There's a part of us that's not changing. That's come into life. Our mind is changing. Our body is changing. The world is changing. But there's a part of us that we can connect to that is an ever-present source of inspiration and strength, light, guidance, always, it's always eternal. It comes into a, and, and in fact, it's part of what, it's, it's what animates this whole thing, this thing called my body, my breath, my mind. And what it says is that basically it inherently has four desires, there's four aims inherent to the soul. In fact, the principle is called what's called in Sanskrit, Purush Artha, it means for the purpose of the soul. So you have these four desires for the purpose of your soul expressing itself. And the first of those is for purpose, that, you're, that you wind up fulfilling your unique purpose. And we all have a unique one. It's really the basis of the book. It's helping people find their unique purpose. Um, <clears throat> you come into life with a unique role to play a, a, and a unique contribution to make to the world. Not only a profession, but really how you're going to be as a parent, a, a child, a seeker, uh, what, what's your creativity like, and you manifest your purpose through all these roles. The second thing is you need the means. So right now we're using a camera, we're using the genius of social media to get this wisdom out into the world. We need the means to fulfill our purpose, and so that's money and health, as well as specific things like technology and those kinds of things. What are the specific means you need in order to fulfill your purpose? The third one is the desire for pleasure. And, you know, first thing that comes to mind is pleasure like sensuality, beauty, art, music, friendship, um, everything that gives you pleasure, including, by the way, accomplishing your goals gives us pleasure. I can see you're happy doing what you do. I know when I finished the book and I turned it in and it went out in the world, I was it was very satisfying. I got pleasure from that. So that's the fulfillment, all, all kinds of pleasure. And it's important to kind of acknowledge the fact that some, a spiritual wisdom or tradition says pleasure is okay. Being in your body and having pleasure is okay, which I think for most of us makes more sense than saying, no, pleasure is really bad. The fourth thing is the longing for spiritual fulfillment, and ultimately that's about freedom. It's like living in the world without burden, you know, and carrying out your other three desires and yet having, the, and having freedom in the midst of that. And that's the, so that's the impulse for prayer and contemplation and meditation. And so, you know, having said those four, described them, taking two minutes or so to describe them, really what I think we do is, you look at that and you say, to the extent that you've got all four happening in your life, they're fulfilled, you've got a full life. And in fact, that same, you know, we find teachings around that, they say, listen, the person who fulfills one of those four categories is inferior. It literally says you've only captured a small part of life. And that doesn't mean whether it's the money part or the spiritual part. If you only have the spiritual happiness, but you don't have a purpose and you haven't fulfilled, you know, the basic means you need to fulfill that purpose, then you don't have it. You know, you're missing a full life. It says the most superior, like the, the ultimate person is the one who fulfills all four. I would just share that I think that should be everyone's goal. 
Well, thank you so much. I have so many questions. We didn't even get to so talk we'll about again. teenagers. Let's do more. We'll do it again. Thank you so much. We're a joy, yeah. Are you having a good time in Snow Mass? I am. It's your home. Sorry, sorry not to be happy. <laughs> thank you. All right.